Tragedies are really good at taking us into the dark and the scary, and good tragedies, however, will bring us back out. And such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made fools of the other senses. It's a study in the worst of human nature. He had so much going for him and so much potential that he was eaten alive by um, envy and greed and ambition to the point where he could not return. His throat is cut. There's one point in the script where it's like he almost just gives up his conscience. He says, okay, I don't even want to be bothered by regrets anymore. I'm just going to do whatever I think. With honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. The character Macbeth suffers from overweening pride, and I think it has a lot to do with the pressures that are put on him, their social pressures, but also because of his natural desire to be, to rise above his station. is to get, the actor, get actors who can understand and comprehend and relate to the material and the more easy they can do that the easier it is for the audience to understand and follow so, so that really was the, the primary focus of auditions. I was so impressed with how many capable students that we have here that were anxious and eager to do Shakespeare. There were just so many students who wanted to be involved and, and participate and that was refreshing. The role of Macbeth is played by David Antablion. He, he does a terrific job in, in communicating Macbeth's arc in change from the beginning to the end of the play. And that was delightful. Um, Meredith Bellows plays Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth is one of those roles for female actresses that every actress covets, um, just because it's such a powerful, wonderful, meaty role for a, for a female. Um, last semester we had a student in our department, Amelia Barr, and she is a, a certified uh, fight specialist. And so she, we utilized her talents to, to choreograph and direct the fight sequences in Macbeth because there are 10 or 12 specific fight moments of fighting that we've that we chosen to depict in the show. And uh, she just did a masterful job because of her experience and expertise in being able to teach those sequences. Oh. Ah! I started working on the fights in October. The show wasn't cast until the 1st of December. And um, immediately after the show was cast, we started our fight rehearsals. And then they had the Christmas break. And um, we had basically two weeks after Christmas break ended to really get the fights polished and ready to go. We took those fights and we, we worked them over and over and over again, working out any little kinks, looking at them, making sure that they were the right that they, they worked in this space and that they were the right length and that, that they didn't take away from anything but that but they were satisfying for what was going on. Some of them are shield and sword fights, some of them are knife fights, some of them are um, two, two men, four sword fights. Um, so there's a very broad level in those and, and um, again you have to look at the time period, you have to look at uh, is it good for the play, is it safe, and is it fun? Shakespeare is frequently in our time period looked on as somebody who is really difficult to understand. And what we did with the actors is we sat them down and, and we taught them how to read Shakespeare's language. We had um, kind of a, a cram session where we taught them how to break the words apart, um, how to look at the rhythm of the words, um, why they should look the words up, why they should look up even words that they thought they understand the meaning to, because the meanings change. We taught them how to look at the, the f structure of the, the lines themselves. Shakespeare tells you in the lines when somebody comes in um, how they're feeling about a particular person or a particular idea. All of those things are actually 
incorporated into the lines to a really great extent. I think in this case I consider myself more of a shadow designer than a lighting designer. There's a lot of shadowiness to the, to the, to the stage um, during the production. A lot of that is uh, to evoke a particular mood and feeling, but it's also to kind of help describe the locale. It's a unit set. Brother Benson has, has uh, designed a, a unit set for our use, which means that there, there's not a lot of specifics in the, in the scenery that give us a lot of idea of where location is. So one of the major objectives for me was to be able to let the audience know very quickly where we are uh, and to establish those rooms, and shadows really helped me to do that. Uh, light coming through windows and then the shadowy places that are left, or um, just the way the light falls on the particular performers also evokes mood and characterization, etc. Uh, we've tried to create a world that's magical when, when we, we have witches and supernatural occurrences, uh, characters and occurrences that happen on stage, and so it needs to feel magical, but it still needs to be tied into that historical world. Uh, at the same time, it is also a very dark play. Um, and we, we don't want to pull any punches necessarily with the darkness of the play because I think that an audience experiencing the darkness of Macbeth's world will have a greater appreciation for the light of their own world. There's almost no room in the black box theater for scene changes because the audience uh, is is uh, all the way around the stage on three sides in this production. We, we decided on a, an idea of a generic space that could become any place that we needed it to be and just allow the actors and the music and the lights to, to determine place changes. And uh, we decided on a map of Scotland for the floor and then we've got some banners that hang behind the set that we can project place names and uh, little map icons so that we can always be kind of aware of where the location is. When the audience walks into the space, they're going to see a very highly elevated set. It's four feet off the ground. The reason for that is because the director asked us early on in the design process if we could have trap doors. That is looking like it's going to be a very exciting time during the play when the trap doors are used and it's it's going to be magical. It takes place in Scotland in the 11th century so the first place I went to was a book that I picked up several years ago called Costumes and Settings for Shakespeare's Plays by John Williams and he says this is one of those of Shakespeare's shows that you can set in the period that it was actually staged to be set in. Um, this would be a time of chain, chain mail and swords and uh, everything in that realm. And we just can't afford to buy chain mail. So we have to find a way to give us at least a hint of what might have been chain mail in a modern fabric. So there's a, a garment that was made out of leather that had nail heads on it called a brigadine. We ordered nail, he nail heads and uh, we kind of made our own. It looks like leather, like they would have been made out of leather, but it's not leather. Uh, but it has that feel of the military uh, knights in shining armor kind of thing. The witches were fun. Again, I go back to this book because there was a picture in this book uh, of witches around a cauldron. And, uh, and I just like the shagginess of them. And so that's kind of what we tried to replicate. Uh, you've probably heard of Amelia Decker. Oh, Amelia Decker Barr. She has done this play with her um, company in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And she had some really fun wigs. So we really started with the wigs on the witches. It evolved between the wigs that we were doing and the layers of fabric that we put on them. In a production meeting, um, the, the set designer brought in his first concept drawing for the set 
and it was um, it was a charcoal drawing with you know the big cauldron and the tattered things and and so I thought okay what is the sound version of charcoal of haze and I thought um, drones somebody will say something and then just whoa, this rumbling will start another um, Inspiration for me was actually the, the fight choreography. I saw the, the energy and uh, kind of the passion that they, they go after this with. And I thought, well, okay, drums. So we've got drums and drones. And then I just it went from there. There are so many sound cues. Probably two or three times as many as I'm used to having in a show. I'm used to having a show that might have 50 sound cues, and that's kind of a big show. But this, this show has... The computer tells me there are 148, but I know that there are some that are point cues in between. I don't want them to say, ooh, the sound was so cool. But I want the sound to support the whole production so that it's one of the elements that l makes them leave here saying, that was worth seeing. That's an experience I'm glad I had. More than any one particular thing, including the fights, I want them to come out and say, I loved that. I want to see something like that again. I want that quality next time I do it. I'm excited for the audience to be engaged in the action of the play from beginning to end. There's just some really cool stuff that's happening and I'm really excited about it and excited to be part of it. It's very exciting with all the sword play, the sound design is brilliant, the set design, the lighting design, all of those elements have really come together to tell a powerful and magnificent story.